All right, that is the Great Commission. And that's what this sermon is about this morning. It's a reminder this morning why we need to be soul winning, why we need to be out there knocking the doors, preaching the gospel. So I want to encourage you to go soul winning today and go soul winning more in your life. If you haven't already participated, hopefully this sermon encourages you to start soul winning, but that's what this sermon is today. Three reasons to go soul winning. Now, the Great Commission, as we read in Matthew 28, is actually alluded to in all four of the Gospels. See John 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So you see, yeah, that's the gospel that is remitting people's sins, that if we go out and preach the gospel, then you can have other people's sins remitted. So it's not that they are remitting sins through their own power, like the Catholic Church. No, no, they are remitting sins because of the preaching that they are doing. Luke 24, And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Look at this. And that repentance and remission of sins, right? That's the gospel. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the repentance, right? To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, when you do that, you have remission of sins. Should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. So you see how they are the witnesses that are to go out and preach the repentance and remission of sins through believing on Jesus Christ. Mark 16, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So notice that we are to go out and preach the gospel. It's not invite people here to hear the gospel. That's why when you come to church on Sunday morning, it's not just a gospel message every morning because it saved people here getting ready to go out and preach the gospel. You go into all the world, not invite from all the world to hear the gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is the same, and we read in Matthew 28, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So we see here the three elements of the Great Commission. Is to teach. What are we teaching them before we baptizing them? We're preaching them the gospel like in Mark 16. You preach the gospel to every creature. Then we baptize them. Then we teach them the Bible. So this is the Great Commission. This ought to be the mission statement of every church, right? To preach the gospel, baptize believers, and teach them the Bible. And it's the main focus at this church. That's why our main ministry is the soul winning. You know, a lot of churches have different ministries. And I'm not against all the different ministries. I think the different ministries are great. But they all are about getting more people, equipping them, teaching. It's all about the Great Commission, right? How are we reaching more people for Jesus? Let's get them baptized. Let's get them learning and growing. That's what all the ministries are about. So, you, you know, whilst it's okay for a church to have social ministries, that should never be the main focus. The main focus of the church is always the Great Commission. And what we want to make sure of is we don't want the Great Commission to be the Great Omission. Right, what does that mean? Now, that's a thing that's not being done. Because in a lot of churches, the preaching of the gospel out in the highways and hedges is not being done. A lot of churches just turning to a social club. We don't want our church to be a social club, first and foremost from the top down, but you don't want the Great Commission to be the Great Omission in your life. Right, So it's not just that, hey, this church needs to be a soul-winning church and it's on a website saying we're a soul-winning church. We need to make sure that every person in this church also is involved in the Great Commission. You don't want the Great Commission to be the great omission in your own life. Just like in this church, it ought to be the main purpose 
The reason why it's the main purpose in this church is because it ought to be the main purpose in your life as well. Right? Not the career. Not the, not the comfortable retirement. Not the one day I want to travel around and see the world. No. It ought to be the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now what are three reasons why we should be keeping the Great Commission? Going soul winning. Well, let's go through three reasons. Number one is that it's commanded. Right? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. We don't have a choice. If you think about it, we're commanded by God to do it. So soul winning is not an optional ministry. Right? There are optional ministries in this church where you say, hey, if you don't want to go along to something, or if you don't want to participate in something, that's fine. It might be a social thing. Soul winning is not a social thing. Soul winning is not an optional ministry in the church. It's something that every believer in this church should be a part of in one way or another. Now, I'm not saying everyone's going to be involved to the same degree as everybody. Right? That's between you and God. How much time you can invest in the soul winning. But it is not something that is optional. You need to understand this. It is commanded to every believer. Why do I stress this point? Because some people get this idea that the Great Commission is just, was just for the early disciples. That's one thing that people say. They'll say, ah, you know, well, you know, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's not for us today. That's just something that Jesus commissioned to them. Or they'll think something like, you know, well, the preaching of the gospel, the soul winning is just for the, the church workers, the bishops, the deacons, the full-time workers. It's not for everybody in the church. You know, not everybody in the church should be soul winning. It's just, you know, it's the full-time people. You know, it's the people that are, are committing their life to doing that. No, no, this is for everybody. And why is that? Even if somebody makes the case that the Great Commission doesn't apply to us now, it only applies to the early believers, which I don't believe, right? Because I think, you know, when you compare Scripture with Scripture, that commandment to preach and baptize and teach people the Bible continues. But even so, let's look at Paul's example to show that Paul indeed encouraged people to be soul winners. Think about this. Let's go through a couple of passages. 2 Corinthians 5. <coughs> And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So you can say Paul is talking about himself here in the sense that he's including himself like we have this ministry of reconciliation. I believe it also applies to us. But I'm just making the argument right now. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are... Now then... We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So you see, Paul acknowledged that he obviously had this ministry committed unto him, so nobody's making the argument that Paul shouldn't be a full-time soul, you know, like winning souls, not a full-time soul, so winning souls and taking part in the Great Commission. Look at what he says here in 1 Corinthians 9. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. See, there's nothing, there's nothing to glory of to say, oh, look at me, look at all the soul winning I'm doing. I ought to be like some great, so commended. No, he's saying, I have nothing to glory of. Why? For necessity is laid upon me. See, it's something you ought to be doing, even though you're not commended. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. We ought to internalize that, guys. We ought to have this same mindset of Paul is, hey, it is necessary for me to preach the gospel. And you know what? Woe is unto me if I'm not involved in the Great Commission, if I'm not preaching the gospel to anybody. Yeah. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily that when I, make, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all, yet, all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. So you see here, 
Paul has a passion about winning people to Christ that he's even willing to try and assimilate as much as he can to relate to other people. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. So what is he saying here? He doesn't assimilate to the point where he's sinful, right? Where he's breaking God's commandments. That I may gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I may gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. See, is there any me in this passage? Is there any, like, my way people should do things the way I do them, follow my culture? No, no, it's about being effective towards other people. It's, it's not, you put yourself aside to try and be effective to other people of other cultures, and you put yourself aside. This is how you are a servant in the Great Commission to other people, where you put your own preferences aside in order to be an effective witness. Now, there is no question that Paul was a soul winner, right? That he preached the gospel, that he was involved in the Great Commission. Now, why are we not excused? Because look at what Paul says to the people following him. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. So even if somebody makes the case, well, the Great Commission's just for the apostles, just for the early people. Well, you know what? One of the apostles told the Gentiles and the people he was teaching, hey, you guys need to be followers of me. Yep. And what would define Paul? If you, were, if you were to give any sort of characteristic to Paul's ministry, what is it? He was an evangelist. Yep. He was a soul winner. He gave his life to preach the gospel. And he is saying to the believers in churches, you need to be a follower of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, right, Paul's ways, which be in Christ, look at this, as I teach everywhere and in every church. 1 Thessalonians 1. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. See, right, so we're not just following the disciples and the apostles. This is the example that the Lord set, right? having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe. So he said, not only is Paul saying, hey, follow me, he's saying, follow those that are following me. They're being an example to you as well. In Macedonia and Archaea, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Archaea, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Think about the Thessalonian church. He's saying here, he's commending them that they were so effective in their ministry that people everywhere throughout the world heard of the Thessalonian church and he's saying, hey, you guys are an example to every other church. So how can we say that this ministry is not for me? You know? Philippians 3, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. See, look out for the people that are following Paul because those are the people you should be following. That's what he's saying there in Philippians 3. Philippians 4, 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. And the last one, 1 Corinthians 11, if I haven't made my point clear already, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So there were many things that Paul obviously taught the believers, but if we think about what was his main thing, it was about the Great Commission, right? It's part of the Great Commission is to teach people the Bible. And Paul was doing that and he wanted people to emulate his example and this goes back to when jesus called the disciples and jesus walking by the sea of galilee saw two brethren simon called peter andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishers and he saith unto them look at this the same words follow me and i will make you fishers of men 
So you see how nothing has changed from when the Lord went out and got his disciples. He made them soul winners. He told them to go out into the world and win souls. And Paul is saying, hey, be followers of me as I follow Christ. That's why the Great Commission is for us. It's commanded to us as well. Now this ministry is not only for the men. It is for the women as well. Because sometimes women get this frame of mind like, ah, you know, my husband, he knows all the doctrine. My husband, you know, he's involved in the ministries. My husband, you know, he's living godly and everything, but it's okay for me to be worldly. You know, my husband, he's going soul winning. You know, we're, we're one flesh. You know, he's doing the soul winning for both of us. No, no, no. Everybody has to be involved in the soul winning, the men and the women. Why is it important? Because not every woman is married. Right? Some women don't have children anymore, you know, in the sense that they're not like, taking care of them at home anymore. Shouldn't they be involved in the Great Commission? You know, and I, I know sometimes women you know, use the excuse to say, well, I've got kids and therefore I can't go soul winning. I, I think that's personally just an excuse because you know, the father can look after the kids for a couple of hours. I mean, kids aren't going to die for two hours. You know, if you just, just feed them before you go, just leave them. They can fuss for a bit, even if they're with dad, while you go out. It's probably, my wife actually prefers that. You know, like when I have to look after the kids on a Sunday afternoon and she goes soul that's like a break, bro. That's like a holiday. She loves it. You know, just go out. She's like, why? Do, she's like saying to me, like, why? I don't get why women don't like going soul winning. You know, you get some time away from the kids. You get to, you know, spend time with another lady. You go, go out, get to meet some people. You get to preach the gospel. I mean, you know, to me, that, that, that beats the, you know, the, sometimes the drudgery of home life, right? Sometimes home, you know, you, sometimes girls go a bit crazy at home, you know, because you're only talking with kids all, all day. So soul winning is a great way to, you know, uh, get out there and so, meet other people, you know, and also get to know the person you're soul winning with. But look here in Acts 2. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. So this is the day of Pentecost, right, when the early church is going out to preach. But look at what it says here, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, if preaching the gospel was only for men, why would God pour out his Holy Spirit on the women as well in order to preach the gospel boldly at the day of Pentecost? That doesn't make sense. So we can see here that obviously God wants everyone to be involved. And like I said, not every woman is looking after children. So who's setting the example for the women to go out soul winning if we, all women are making up excuses for why they can't go soul winning, yeah. right? Because how are we going to raise our daughters to say, hey, you know, yeah, you're not married yet. You should be involved in the soul winning. Yeah, your children are growing up. You should be involved in the soul winning. Women ought to be part of the soul winning as well. And your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens. I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Philippians 4, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So soul winning is commanded. It's not an optional ministry. It is for us today as believers to follow them as they followed Christ. Ultimately, we are following Christ and we need to make sure women are going soul winning as well that's why I make it a point in my life to make sure my wife and I switch you know if you find your wife's not going soul winning guys you gotta you know sometimes encourage them and go hey I'll look after the kids you go this week you know so to make sure that they are participating as well because you know what the longer you go it's just like in anything in life if you don't use it you lose it right and if you're not out there preaching the gospel you know you're not out there regularly sharing the faith you know what you start to forget how to explain it and then you go out soul winning you know what happens you go out soul winning after a long famine of not going soul winning and you're knocking the doors and and this is this is i feel like this is one of the worst things to happen sometimes is that you knock on a door and you're, and you're shocked, because you haven't been going soul winning for so long, you're shocked that somebody's even willing to talk to you, right? And then when you're shocked that somebody's willing to talk to you, you like choke, because you're not used to explaining it. Yeah. 
And what a, what a sad day is that when you have somebody at the door willing to listen to you and you're not ready to preach the gospel. Ah, oh, what a tragedy. Because isn't that what we fight for? Isn't that what we go out for? To hopefully get the opportunity to preach the gospel to somebody. But you haven't been going soul winning for so long, you forget how to do it. And then you get an opportunity. Or you get an opportunity at work and you choke and you fumble. And you know that may be the difference between somebody getting convinced or not in that moment. Because of your confidence, your boldness, your ability to explain it to them and be sharp. But why? Because you've been practicing. You've been thinking about it. You've been trying to improve how you explain the gospel. So you, can, you don't have to give, give, give it another thought when somebody talks to you. You can just go straight into it. I know, I know how to handle this situation because I've handled it hundreds of times before. So that brings me on to my next point, which is hell. Hell is a reason why we need to go soul winning. Let's go to Philippians 2. It's an interesting passage here, verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, I don't know if you've ever had this thought when you've read through Philippians 2. Well, you kind of think, man, I, you, know, you might think, I know people in the world that hate God so much, or nothing to do with God. Like, you know, they just, they just scoff at the thought of God. But yet the Bible's saying one day, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what happens to these people to make them change their mind? Well, there's no guess because my second point is hell. But let's look in Revelation 20. If you're familiar with end times, you know that one day there will come a period where Jesus Christ will rule and reign for a thousand years. Right? So that means for somebody living now as an unbeliever, if they were to die, up until this point we're about to read, they have spent a minimum of 1,000 years in hell. And you know what? I don't care how much of an atheist you are or how much, of a, how much you hate God or how much you scoff at believers, you scoff at the Bible. After you spend 1,000 years in hell, you will have been humbled. And you know what? When they first go to hell, I'm sure there's a bit of anger, like, ah, I can't believe God sent me here and everything like that. But as the days and the weeks and the months and the years go on, because an unbeliever probably doesn't know what's going to happen after a thousand years, they start to realize, I'm here forever. There is no out. And you know what's going through their mind? They're probably thinking of all the times the gospel came to them. All the, all the Christians that they knew. All the times they rejected God and they're just thinking, if only I had one more chance. And then Revelation 20, 11 happens. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and look at this, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. So what is going to make every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father? Because that person who's been burning in hell for at least a thousand years, hoping for one more chance, is all of a sudden brought out of hell. The burning stops. The tormenting stops. And what do you think is the first thing that's going to come from their lips? Jesus, please save me. You are the Lord. 
But you know what? It's too late. But that's what hell does to the unbeliever. It's going to humble everyone. It'll remove hope itself. That's how bad hell is. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now we learn a lot about hell from Luke 16, which is a story about somebody that went to hell. I'm going to read through it and I'm going to give you some thoughts here. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to, uh, to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So this is talking about the earth, not just a, a space in, in, inside hell. <coughs> Then he, said, I, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou, thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And you know what's so sad about that? It's because one did rise from the dead, and people still do not believe on him. So a couple of thoughts here from this parable. Oh, no, sorry, not parable, what am I talking about? From this story. People try and turn it into a parable. That's one of my points. A couple of things we learn from this story. Number one, is that hell is a real place. People try and explain away hell by trying to say that this story is just a parable. But this, this is not a parable. Why? If it was a parable, why do the characters in this parable have a specific name? Lazarus. No, the rich man doesn't, but you've got Abraham. There are certain people in this story that have a name. It's not a parable. But even so, saying it's a parable doesn't explain away the facts in this story because why? A Think about what a parable is. A parable is when you use real examples to explain something spiritual. So if this is a parable, it's saying that there's a rich man in hell. That means that's a real thing. Yep. So then what, what, is it, what is the parable then explaining if this is a parable? So you see, it's like when it says a certain man had a vineyard. The vineyard is a real thing. So if a rich man's going to hell and this is a parable, that means there's a rich man that can go to hell. That's a real thing. So to say it's a parable doesn't explain it away. It also shows us as well that there's no such thing as purgatory. Yeah. Right? Catholics, Orthodox, and now you've got people like Tyler Doka, right? Teaching a Baptist purgatory, going to this hell temporarily. This shows that well, a believer, if they're saved, goes immediately to heaven to be with Abraham. And an unbeliever goes directly to hell. His next breath. And in hell, he lifts up his eyes, being in torment but you know what is i think the most insightful thing in this passage is because we see the mind of somebody who's in hell and what they are thinking right when he says here for i have five brethren that he may testify unto them look at this lest they also come into this place of torment so what do we learn here? We learn that when somebody goes to hell, 
What are they thinking? Don't let anyone else come here. That's what they're thinking. And that's a message to us to do our best to convince others not to go there. Yes, everyone may have had a chance to hear the gospel, so they're not unaccountable for their sins, right? They're not unaccountable for rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what I think? I think where we make the difference is we may be able to change somebody's mind before they go, right? Because it's like when we go out there, people have heard of Jesus, but you know the difference we make when we go out and we preach the gospel is we give them another chance to repent, right? To change their mind, to believe on Jesus. And this is what this rich man is hell is begging Abraham. He's saying, now that I'm here, don't let the people that I care about come to this place of torment and hopefully somebody can go and tell them and warn them of this place. You know, people don't want to acknowledge hell. They don't want to think that such a terrible place exists, but it does, unfortunately. You know, us not believing in reality does not remove reality. Not believing in hell does, does not remove it, its existence, does not remove the witness that we have from Jesus, from God himself, saying that this terrible place exists and it's the punishment for our sins. And you know, we, 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 we sometimes can't fathom a place like hell because we trivialize God's holiness. Right? We think, you know, we, we sin all the time and think, oh, we'll get away with it, it's not that big a deal. But you know, the reality of hell ought to teach you that it is a big deal. Because unless you receive the forgiveness through Jesus Christ, a place of eternal fire and torment, eternal conscious fire and torment awaits those people. That's how bad sin is. You know, people say things like, how can a loving God create hell? Well, you know what? A loving, the love of God didn't create hell. Right? It's the holiness of God that created hell. That's what created hell. So that's why they're getting it mixed up. They think God is just love. No, God is not just love. God is holiness as well. He's just. Right? He hates sin. And it's that side of him that created hell. And you know what? Somebody who's scoffing at God saying, well, loving God wouldn't create hell. Well, you know what the loving God did? The loving God died for their sins. And if they would just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they wouldn't have to go to hell. Right? So it's not like God's blackmailing them. He gave them the free ticket. Right? If they, hate, if they believe in hell and hate it so much, then there's nothing stopping them from believing on Jesus Christ. Right? They can believe on Jesus Christ. You know, if they don't like hell so much, why don't they just take the free ticket out? So my question to you is, do you believe hell is real? I mean, if you believe hell is real, I mean, does it, I mean, does it concern you at all? I mean, does the unbelieving rich man in hell have more compassion than we do? If we believe hell exists, don't we want others to be saved? I mean, do you have no desire to get other people saved? It's like that, that clip from a famous atheist, you know, uh, what was his name? Penn, from Penn and Teller. And he was an atheist and doesn't believe in heaven and hell, but he, he made a comment saying, you know what, if I believed in hell and didn't tell somebody about how to escape hell, I'd be a pretty terrible person. Even as an unbeliever, he was, a, he, was will, he was able to see that. Yeah. And yet, so believers that acknowledge hell, that know hell exists, has, have less concern than even an atheist that realizes, you know what, if I believed in a place like this, yeah, sure, I would pros proselytize, that's what he says. I would tell people, I would evangelize. So whilst he doesn't agree with it and he scoffs it, he at least understands why Christians would want to try and reach him want to try and not want him to go to hell. So the question to you is, do you believe hell exists? If you believe hell exists, why doesn't it change the way you behave? Why doesn't it change your values? I mean, what sort of Christians are we? 
if we know this place exists, a place where Jesus said something like this. He said, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I mean, that's pretty extreme language to say, you know what? You'd rather stick your hands into your own eye socket and rip it out then go to hell with both your eyes. That's how terrible this place is. And if you believe this place exists, don't you have concern for other people to go there? Man, we gotta get involved in the Great Commission so we can convince as many people as possible not to end up in hell. And the last one, so it's commanded. Number two, hell is a real place. And number three, is rewards. So this one's last, just a quick point here is, you know, obviously one reason why you want to go soul winning is, you know, what other thing in life is worth putting your time and money into? <laughs> you know, I, I'm an investor myself, right? I invest money. I like a good investment. Most people like something that's stable, increases in value over time, things like that. And people say, well, what's a hedge against the stock market? What's a hedge against falling prices? Well, you might say gold. Gold and silver is that rock solid hedge for my finances, right? If everything goes to, 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 to the trash, to, to the, to the to, to, you know, to, to goes down, I always have the gold and silver. Well, you know what? Well, what's your hedge against judgment day? <laughs> what's your hedge against once all these things are gone? You need to lay up some treasure in heaven. You know, I like a good investment. I like a, I'm looking forward to a comfortable retirement, but I'm not just looking to this 80 years that I'm here. I'm looking to my nice, comfortable retirement when I get to heaven. All those treasures that are laid up there, not here. 1 Corinthians 3. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, Wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. So this is talking about the judgment of the believer. Right? So the believer, his works are going to get tried. You have the foundation, Jesus Christ. You have your salvation. But what are you going to build on that foundation? Are you going to build gold, silver, and precious stones that are going to abide the fire? Are you building on their wood, hay, and stubble that when once it's tried by fire, it's all going to get burned up? The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, a lot of people that believe in purgatory, I don't even notice, but they'll go to this passage to try and prove that this is purgatory. But notice what's being burnt here in 1 Corinthians 3. It's not the believer that's getting burnt. It's his works that are getting burnt. Right now in hell, it's actually the believer that's getting burned. In purgatory, it's the believer that's getting burned, right? He's getting purged of his sins in purgatory. So that's why this is not a passage talking about the fires of purgatory. This is a passage talking about God trying your works, right? So you're going to watch your works built on Jesus' foundation. It's going to get tried by fire and what is going to remain. Now, even if all your works are burnt up, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work, see there, shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Why? Because the fire tries the work, but the foundation will always be there. Right? You will always be saved. Rewards is a reason why you want to go soul winning. How are you going to invest your time and your money? You know, like people talk about, like, you know, you want to convert from, you know, going from different markets. They might say, oh, I'm going to convert swap from gold to silver i'm going to swap from precious metals to property i'm going to swap from precious metals to stocks or you know whatever right they talk about holding different asset classes but you know as christians you know what we got to do we got to hold some heavenly asset classes we got to figure out how you got to swap there are some times when you got to swap those physical assets to heavenly assets right and change that portfolio 1 Corinthians 9, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Talking about this eternal reward that is incorruptible. So how do you 
switch al asset allocation in your portfolio to a heavenly asset allocation, right? To a, to a heavenly proportion. You know, what, if you were to think of, you know, most people, they think of their asset allocation like 80% bon uh, shares, 10% stocks or whatever, 10% bonds, 10% precious metals. Yeah, maybe you think of your wealth that way if you only look to the things of this world, right? If your treasures are only on earth. But have you ever thought about what your entire portfolio looks like? And I wonder if you were to add on the heavenly, what your percentages would be, right? And we obviously, we don't have an exact measure, but just something for you to reflect on. When you think about the proportion of your treasures, where are they? Heaven or on earth? And what do you think that proportion is? Now, how do you start to shift those resources to a heavenly reward? Well, what was the crown that Paul strived for? We're looking at 1 Thessalonians 2. But what is our hope or joy of crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. So you see here, it all goes back to the Great Commission. How do you change your time and your resources into heavenly treasures? Well, it's about participating in the Great Commission, and you can see how many jewels have you got on this crown of rejoicing in, the terms, of, in terms of how many people have you helped or contributed to, to winning them to Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. So that's why your rewards in heaven is going to be a measure of your effectiveness or your contribution to those that will be in heaven. Second last passage, 2 Peter 3. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So that's like 1 Corinthians 3. And this is the passage I love, and I, I know I've preached this so often in this church because it's such a great reminder for us to reflect on how we're living our life while we spend it on this earth. Look at this. Seeing then that all these things, all the material things in this life shall be dissolved and burned up. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? What is the Bible saying here? Do you realize that all your material possessions will one day be gone? Just like I asked you, do you believe hell is real? If you reflect on that, is that going to change some of the things in your life? Why don't you reflect on the fact as well that one day all the material things you own are going to be gone. What's going to be left? Think about that. Is that going to change how you live your life? Is that going to change what you do with your time? Is that going to change what you do with your money? You know, hopefully it does. Three reasons to go soul winning, and then I just want to end on one more point. One, we're commanded. Two, hell is real. Three, what else is worth investing your life into? But I want to end on this point. Matthew 9, Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. See, Jesus didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as having sheep, as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And you know that saying is as true back then as it is today. That the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. I'm sure there are many more people out there. You know, we've got, I think as a church so far this year, there's like been 27 people get, got saved. Hundreds, hundred plus people have heard the gospel. But you know what? 
I'm sure there are a lot more out there willing to hear the gospel, ready to get saved. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And you know what? You know, people can contribute to soul winning by giving money, obviously. You know, and that's, that's just a necessary part of life, is that, you know, you need money to pay the bills, pay, pay salaries, you know, buy equipment, things like that. So yeah, this is a necessary part, and this is one way people can contribute to preaching the gospel. But you, you know what, guys? It doesn't really take that much money to preach the gospel. You know, to have equipment, you know, this equipment, I mean, we've pretty much got everything we have now. We're not a huge church, but over the years, I mean, we've, we've had enough money to buy this stuff. And you know what, even if you think about it, even if you were to support me full time, that, that's not a lot of money if you think about it, right? I mean, you think maybe 10 to 20 full-time salaries, if people were giving consistently, you could have a full-time worker. You know, but the reason why our church doesn't have a full-time worker, people just aren't giving consistently. That's just one part of it. But the point I'm making here is, I don't want people to have this mindset that I work, I give to a ministry, I've done my part in the Great Commission. Because that's... Some of my friends, when I was growing up, that was their mindset. You know, because I was trying to encourage them to go soul winning, and they're thinking, oh, you know what? My part in the Great Commission, I'm going to go out and work, focus on my career, and then I'm going to give money to support others who are going to preach the gospel. But what I want you to think about today is, it doesn't take that much money to, to, to pay a full-time soul winner, right? To, to, to fund the work where people are going out and soul winning. But you know what? You could throw millions and millions of dollars at me and you know what? I can only talk to so many people. Yeah. I can only do so much as one person. So, you know, that money is what is it going to go to, right? It's going to go to just, I don't know what other. Eventually you get to a point where you've got too much and it becomes a hindrance where churches start, you know, having property and thinking about how they're going to run a community centre and, and then it just becomes something other than the Great Commission. But you know what God needs to get the job done? Because like I said, you could throw millions of dollars at me, but I'm only one person. But if everybody chips in a little bit of labor, and imagine what our church would accomplish. You know what? We got like five to six soul winners out every week, eight soul winners out every week. And that's what we've accomplished so far. If we just doubled that, we, would double, we could double those numbers. But you couldn't, you, if you threw more money at it, it's not like they're going to talk to knock more doors. You know, people are already doing the most that they can. You know, obviously we can all do more. But that's why the harvest is plenteous and the laborers are few because even though it's necessary to give to the work of God, you know what is even more necessary is that you are a laborer, that you get involved because the people that are already doing stuff already most of us most of the people serving in ministry are already stretched thin so they're doing as much as they can already but if you contribute with labor man that's how we're going to multiply and get the gospel out there so man i hope god gets a hold of your heart you know i hope that when you hear the word of god and you hear these reasons that we ought to go soul winning, that your heart is stirred, because that's the only thing that makes believers move, is that the Holy Spirit moves in your heart, and you get a, you get a zeal, you get a desire, it clicks in your mind, and you think, man, what am I living for? Man, hell is real. I better get out there and preach the gospel. Man, I hope this sermon does that to you today. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. Thank you for the reminder of the responsibility that we have as believers. Yeah, Lord, we can give our money, and that is a necessary part. But, Lord, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So, Lord, help us to be laborers. Help us to internalize these reasons for why we ought to be going soul winning. And, Lord, I just pray that we would have more compassion than the rich man burning in hell. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.